Good evening. Good to see you here. Um, I'm going to turn on the little light. Let's uh, rise for the call to worship found from the Psalms. Let's rise for that, if you will, if you can. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Amen. Let's turn to our first hymn, number 176. Hail thou once despised Jesus. Very fine hymn, 176. Hail thou once despised Jesus, hail the Galilean King, thou didst suffer to release us, thou didst free salvation bring. Hail Because I'm going to ask if you turn to um, page 796 in the back of the hymnal. We're going to uh, read Psalm 34, but I thought might we wait, might do it responsibly. <clears throat> so that's in the back of the hymnal, page 796, and um, it is Psalm 34. It's a beautiful psalm, and I'll read the light, and you can read the dark, and we'll make our way through this, uh, this psalm. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My 
Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Come, my children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Evil will slay the wicked, but the foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. So that takes us to Psalm 6. Uh, 24, uh, excuse me, him, him 624. Psalm 30. I'm sorry, I was going with my check mark, but I didn't catch that one. Well, we'll sing that one soon. <laughs> so, um, this, is, um, this is from Psalm, uh, Psalm 34, a uh, familiar tune down. So through all the changing scenes of life. So we get another chance to look at Psalm 34.
Well, um, we're going to uh, take some time to pray together, and we, um, on, on this, whatever it is, second Sunday of the month, typically receive prayer requests. So if you'd um, care to um, bring your prayer request before us, we have, of course, some in the back of the bulletin, but um, um, there are others that maybe you'd like to pray for. Yes. We can just, Claude mentioned this in his um, email yesterday in the congregation, but just be thinking of Tracy Morris this week. Um, she's had a number of these scares where they find a mask and they have to go check that out. And the reason it's so scary is that if they find that it's cancerous, her transplant is a loss. Um, and so she, every time they find something, Mm. Yeah, yeah. So just pray for her now as she gets the follow up MRI. And, um, Is she getting that this, this coming week? Okay. Did everybody hear that? Tracy Morris, um, this um, follow up MRI. It's uh, very important. Other things? Um, yes. Oh, I thought it was on. Okay. That's a prayer request, too. That I'll remember to turn my mic on. All right. Yes, other things. Yeah. My wife and daughter are on vacation. Where now? In Arizona oh, and Arizona. New Mexico. Arizona. My prayer would be for traffic nurses. Okay. Well, that's better than wherever they were last time, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. We'll, we'll pray for you, too. The Lord will keep you. <laughs> and, uh, I have peace and quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's pray for um, everybody in Arizona and New Mexico. Other things? Yes, Julia. baby. That's good news. Yeah, Jana is expecting. This is Ajalon's uh, wife. He's the associate pastor at um, um, Covenant OPC in Sinking Spring. Yes, Emma? Can you say 481? 481? <clears throat> oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I think we can do this, but let's take some more uh, prayer things first. Yes, 481, I'll keep that in mind. Yes. a great uh, important prayer request from Nero Hochborg. Lviv has um, been attacked before, but this was uh, more um, civilian oriented and this family of five. Um, so pray for him. Um, uh, pray that God would restrain the wrath of men, brothers and sisters. Um, so, but particularly for Ukraine and, and Lviv. No, nothing. Ed, no. Okay. Other things? Yes, no? All right. Um, let's, um, we have also, well, I'll just pray for them. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, you are um, the great and sovereign Lord, and your ways are beyond our searching out. You know, Lord, um, and love.
love your church and we do pray for it. We pray for our own congregation, for faith, for other congregations in our presbytery. Um, we pray your mercies um, upon us all that we would love you and serve you. We, we um, pray that you would lift up your name in our hearts morning and evening. We thank you that you are a great and holy God. Lord, you are infinite and unchangeable, um, eternal in your being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, truth. Lord, we worship you um, this evening. And we are encouraged um, to pray, and, and so we do. We, we, uh, we not only thank you for your grace, but intercede on behalf of our brothers and sisters again in faraway lands and those who are um, suffering greatly. We remember those suffering for the sake of the gospel. Lord, for those who are persecuted uh, for Christ's sake. Uh, we remember too to pray especially for the, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We uh, pray for the church in Lviv and, and um, for their ministry to those who are tired and worn out and fearful and broken hearted um, that they might minister that grace with which you have ministered to them. Lord, we pray closer to home for um, uh, Tracy Morris. We ask that you would undertake for her. You would uh, give her a light heart in spite of all of these um, difficulties that have beset her. And we pray for good news from this uh, test she'll be having this week. Lord, we pray that she would be able to have this uh, transplant. We <clears throat> pray for um, um, the Duffies as they are um, uh, on and traveling and vacation in Arizona and New Mexico. We pray for Ed at home and we pray for your blessing uh, upon, uh, upon them, Carol and Jennifer. Lord, we rejoice to receive good news. We thank you for the uh, recent marriage of um, uh, Susanna and uh, Matthew and we thank you for uh, new babies, Lord, even uh, for my um, my uh, daughter-in-law Jana, um, church that you would uh, that you would protect this little one within her, and that he might or she might be born strong and well. Um, Lord, we uh, thank you for uh, the gift of of life, Lord, and we rejoice in it. Um, uh, we uh, pray for those who are students and returning back to school, Lord, and you would give them discernment and and wisdom and prepare them for that life which you have for them. Um, we continue to pray for uh, Damaris uh, Perez for her neck and, and neck and, and, and knee pain and we pray for, um, continue to pray for Becky's brother Bill. Uh, we thank you that Ruth is with us again this evening and we ask your blessing upon her as she continues to recover. We thank you for Bob's ministry and piano and we pray for him and for uh, Hannah as she's expecting and also Desiree. Um, Lord God, we <clears throat> uh, pray for the week before us uh, that you would walk with us as you have promised. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be very mighty in our midst, turn our eyes in joy to you in song and prayer and help us to be a witness for your grace, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hymn number 320 is our hymn of preparation. Rejoice, all ye believers. 320.
for the fourth verse, the fourth verse stretch. <laughs> The Committee on Foreign Missions of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, Bob and Shirley Marshall, Kaohsiung, Taiwan, March 1983. Dear praying friends of Taiwan, <clears throat> last night I saw Satan fall. Let me tell you how it happened. Last night our family gathered with more than 40 adults plus numerous children to participate in a very special kind of worship service. We first assembled at the church building where we sang a hymn and prayed together pleading for God's supernatural help and deliverance in the mission we were about to undertake. Then we made our way to the home of a family named Wu where we all climbed the steps to the fifth floor rooftop. There, under a metal canopy, we crowded in front of a small room filled with the familiar gaudy apparatus of idol worship and ancestor veneration found in most Taiwanese homes. The Wu family had determined that those things would no longer dominate their lives. Accordingly, they had asked for the assistance of God's people in helping them to remove the blasphemous objects once and for all. The Wu household is made up of Mr. and Mrs. Wu, their son and daughter-in-law, some preschool-age grandchildren, and a 91-year-old adopted great-grandmother. The old woman is the key person. She has already confessed her faith in Christ and been baptized as a Christian. It was in the course of her being taken um, to Christian worship services each Sunday that the other members of the household were exposed to the teachings of the Bible and gradually determined to turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, Acts 28, 6, 18. Now they were all in one accord and were seeking to be set apart in this public fashion as sacred members of the household of faith. The pastor <clears throat> led in singing several appropriate hymns while his wife uh, accompanied on a mouth organ, read harmonica. Uh, uh, two deacons uh, read from the scriptures, and then the pastor preached a short but powerful sermon. First, he talked about the Ten Commandments. He showed from the first commandment, the first five commandments, they required the worship of the one and true God and forbid the worship of anyone or anything in his place. Since the Chinese people regard filial piety, that is piety of, to parents, uh, to be a, one of the highest uh, human virtues, and since Christians in China are often accused of being unfilial, he next went on to explain that the last five commandments were given by God precisely to establish a proper kind of filial piety, thus preserving respect and righteousness in men's relationships to one another. Finally, he turned to John 8 and spoke of the way in which God's law was not given to enslave people, but rather to set them free. He made repeated references to Satan, who specializes in making people helpless slaves to the demands of sin and self. Jesus came to change all of that. He came proclaiming truth, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. He came to grant liberty um, and to the slaves of darkness and fear like the woos. He ex emphasized that Christ alone had the power to grant such liberation 
and yet that it is readily available to all who will look to him in simple faith. At the conclusion of the sermon, the Wu family knelt down and publicly begged for God to forgive their sins of failing to worship and serve him alone. They implored God through the work of Christ to restore them back into his fellowship once again. It was at that point that the pastor, with great authority, instructed the elders and deacons present to come forward and begin dismantling all of the objects and pictures connected with idol worship. About six or seven men began removing ceramic idols and wooden ancestor tablets from the god shelf. They pulled down Chinese lanterns and blazoned with incantations and the pictures of angry red-faced gods. They carried away incense burners and glass cases containing silver ornaments. At the very last, they struggled with a large glass-framed pitcher uh, of other pagan deities. It was attached to the wall and stubbornly refused to yield up its central place in the house. During that flurry of activity, as numerous articles were being dismantled and carried outside to be placed in waiting cars, the rest of us stood and repeatedly sang, stand up, stand up for Jesus, until the task was completed. The members of the Wu family remained seated near the front. It was not difficult to imagine the tremendous conflict that must have been taking place in their hearts as they deliberately broke ranks with hundreds of generations of their ancestors. They were daring in the name of King Jesus to dethrone the devil and the hosts of wicked demons. What would their neighbors think? How would non-Christian relatives react? What would be the effect upon their jobs, their health? It was not an easy step. In fact, humanly speaking, it was an impossible step. Well, that uh, is a fascinating letter, isn't it? Uh, written some years ago by uh, OP missionary Bob Marshall, writing from Taiwan back in 1983. Um, the first time that we have, really, I think that's the first time I've read about the destruction of, um, of idols in modern times, in our times. But, but I'm sure we've all read about um, something similar uh, in uh, the Bible, frequently we read about it in the Old Testament where Israel is instructed to burn or bury or otherwise destroy pagan idols. And it shouldn't surprise us to read about it in the New Testament as well. And I suppose it should raise some uh, questions about our disposition of idols in our lives. Uh, we come to these issues in the city of Ephesus in our study through the Acts of the Apostles we're now in chapter 19 at verse 8. So if you'll turn there in the scriptures that you have with you or in front of you. We'll read uh, chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 beginning at verse 8. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he, that is Paul, withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to uh, invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. The seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva 
were doing this. But the, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit uh, leaped upon them, mastering all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Well, we, um, we come now uh, to these issues um, in the city of Ephesus. Um, Ephesus, um, um, in Ephesus it wasn't um, images of angry, um, uh, angry gods and, and articles of ancestor worship that was disposed of, but instead these magic scrolls, magical scrolls, scrolls filled with secret incantations and spells, and sometimes names that were supposed to be secret, special names. Um, Ephesus had a reputation, um, as a matter of fact, as a center of dark magical practices, uh, much of it attached to the unutterably vile worship that occurred um, in the large temple precincts of Artemis, or the Temple of Diana, of which was the great feature, and of which we'll hear more next Lord's Day evening. Uh, the atmosphere of the city, writes one historian, was electric with sorcery and incantations, with exorcists and all kinds of magical imposters. It appears from all indications to be a city appeared to be a city soaked in demonic presence and occultic deception. Uh, one part of this occultic activity revolves around recitations or pronouncements of, of various secret incantations that were preserved on the, well, on the aforementioned scrolls. And indeed, some of these scrolls, the like of which are referred to in our text, are even mentioned in Shakespeare <laughs> um, and mentioned and, and can be found. Uh, they're, um, they survive to this day and on display in museums in London and Paris and Leiden. Um, but even then, those scrolls were considered very valuable. And in the case of Acts 19, we read that 50,000 pieces of silver or drachmas were burned. A drachma was the common wage for a day's labor. Um, a considerable sum of money was burned up. So what would, what would possess someone to uh, to put to the flames uh, such a valued possession. They weren't given away. We're not told that. They're not sold. They're burned. Uh, what could cause people to burn their scrolls? What could, what could have made the, the woos uh, be rid of their idols and paraphernalia? I'm sure they didn't sell them. I suppose they were carted off to the, uh, to the, to the dump. Um, uh, I'm sure we can hardly imagine the, imagine the loss uh, both monetary and, and socially and emotionally. I think that um, Mr. Marshall tries to give a sense of that, describing the effect that it must have had on the woos, the burning of idols. But if we look carefully at this passage of Scripture, there may be some help here in understanding why these people did what they did and why you and I must be willing to follow suit. Uh, and something to take notice of about faith versus magic. When we look at Acts 19, we discover, uh, interestingly, that the possessor of these books or scrolls were believers, perhaps fairly new believers, but they were believers. But having heard the message of the gospel, uh, they professed to believe it, uh, and yet they were holding on to some of their old habits, their old ways, their old devilish scrolls, at least. Uh, for them, uh, the incident that precipitated their breaking away from their wicked past, their leaving behind or burning these uh, idols, 
um, was the botched or unsuccessful um, exorcism of a demon by these seven sons of Siva in verse uh, 13. Now the effort of the sons of Siva uh, was inspired, no doubt, by the recent demonstrations of um, power associated with the name of God. Uh, certain Christians, and we're notably mentioning here the Apostle Paul, had achieved some notoriety uh, by, um, in, in, by miracles that were performed in the name of Christ. Uh, in fact, in Paul's case, we're told in verse 11 that even some of the handkerchiefs that would be sweat rags that Paul had tied around his head and work aprons that he had wore while laboring in his business, uh, secular business uh, in tent making, uh, uh, being taken and uh, touched, uh, they, they were taken to the sick and diseased and, and uh, these folks were, were healed. Now, this is difficult to explain and it does almost seem to smack of a sort of magical power itself. And yet, um, <clears throat> we know from the Bible that it absolutely forbids uh, magical associations and magical arts, and Scripture is quite strong on that. So we, and, and really, we have so little information here, we're, it's probably wise not to speculate much. I think we simply have to conclude that while these people act, acted in faith, that is, those who were healed, Believing God was able to work even through these sweat rags and dirty aprons worn by the apostle, well, God blessed that faith and, and, and healed them. Um, I suppose we should take notice of the fact that uh, the text specifically records that it was God who did these things uh, and that they were not simply ordinary, if you can speak of the word ordinary with regard to miracles. They were not the sort of miracles that were more common, but they were noted here as ex extraordinary uh, miracles, uh, by which uh, designation I suppose to regard them uh, to, as they appear, as acts of God that were, that were beyond the nature of the miracles which God uh, wrought most often through the hands of the apostles. And it's important to notice <clears throat> that this occurrence the handkerchiefs, and also the reference to the, the, uh, the shadow of the Apostle Peter falling upon some uh, unfortunate folk uh, were, um, were, were neither widespread uh, through the Apostles' ministry nor commanded as normative, but simply reported without detail or explanation. And, and we know that, um, that these sorts of miracles are recorded to have occurred only during the apostolic period of history and ended with the death and disappearance of the apostle. The later books of the Bible make no reference to these uh, to miracles uh, directly at the hands of one of the apostles. Uh, but apparently, even so, they were easily misunderstood as we read on to discover. Even today, <clears throat> there much harm, I think, is done uh, that it's reminiscent of this sort of tomfoolery um, that we uh, read about in, uh, here in the text with the, the seven sons. Uh, we hear about evangelists and Christian workers who, who use the name of Jesus almost as a magical incantation, repeating it loudly over and over again. Um, is, um, now, it, it's one thing to, to repeat the Lord's name and over in love and adoration. It's another to use it as almost a magical formulation uh, or incarnation in the name of Jesus and, and some sort of power there in the saying of it. Uh, but that's really what we see here in the text. And it's exactly the point here. What we have this evening is really a perfect example of faith versus manipulative magic. Uh, the sons of Siva... Uh, sons of a high priest, whether he was a bona fide high priest or just some itinerant Jewish uh, holy man. Uh, <clears throat> it's uncertain in the minds of scholars. It's really not important. What is of note is the behavior of his sons who try their hands at a little exorcism, um, uh, seeking to drive out an evil demon of a possessed man. Now, they repeat the name of Jesus, and does it work? No. In fact, it it backfires rather badly. Uh, what happens 
uh, what's going on? I mean, Peter and the other apostles drive off demons. Why not these seven? Well, the tip-off is the form of address that we read in verse 13. Notice what they say. I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Or as the expression is translated in the uh, NIV 84, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you, come out. Now, does that sound like a very familiar way to address the Lord Jesus? Is that the way we pray? In the name of Jesus, whom Claude Taylor preaches, I command you. Uh, we, would, we would find some fault with that. Um, it, it's a cold formula of address, at, at the very least, that, that belies the fact that, that these young men had no personal acquaintance with Christ at all. They were not addressing the Lord. They were addressing, uh, they didn't even know who they were addressing, someone who they'd heard about at best, and they'd heard that this was an effective name to, to name, and that they could simply name it uh, faithlessly and uh, sort of opportunistically, and things would happen. Well, things did happen, <laughs> not what they expected, of course. Um, and I think this interpretation is borne out by the demon's response in verse 15. A demon says... Jesus I know. He's the rule of the universe. Even the demons believe in God and they tremble. Paul, I know him too. He's a servant of Christ, an adopted son of God. He's powerful and I hate him, but I can't touch him. He's been sealed with the mark of Christ. But who are you? It's not even really a question. It's a rhetorical jab. The demon knows jolly well who these fellows are. They are themselves miserable pawns of the devil, powerless tools, uh, satanic, satanic drones. Uh, he has a, he, the, the demon has no fear of them whatsoever. He evilly, easily overcomes them and beats them near to death. Well, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, our power and spiritual protection in this world, a world which we do share to a degree with demons and forces of evil, comes to us by virtue of our personal relationship with Christ through faith. Um, if we name Christ in faith as one of his elect children, the devil will flee, we're told that. But to simply talk Christian talk and speak Christian words or pray in Jesus' name, amen, without a saving relationship with Christ is not a particularly powerful uh, thing. In fact, it's using the name of Christ as a magic formula which holds neither power nor protection. Uh, these men are seeking to use the name of Jesus as a magical formula. They're trying to manipulate God for their own ends, perhaps even for their own glory or financial profit. And that's really a definition of magic. You know, when Alibaba wants to open the door to the cave filled with treasure. He has to come up with the exact right formula, remember? The right words said in the right order. Um, and if he gets it right, well, then the magical power is compelled to do what he demands. That's magic. But faith, faith is altogether different. In faith, we don't seek to manipulate God. We, we may humbly... A hold forth God's revealed uh, uh, promises that we read in Scripture, but we do so in faith, that we do so in the knowledge and trust that God answers prayer according to his loving wisdom and, and timing. We pray, presuming not upon some sort of secret knowledge or power of our own, but solely on the basis of our covenant relationship with God, of which he, which he freely established uh, with us as his children. Uh, as Abba, Father. Moreover, our faith is not focused uh, upon ourselves, but upon the glorification of God. We want more than anything to see God glorified. We don't know how that will happen. Sometimes very difficult things occur, but we trust the Lord to answer our prayers in wise ways. We pray with the desire and with the overarching purpose that his perfect will be done. That's what Jesus told us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Because we believe that God knows better than us, because we ultimately want his name exalted, not ours. But there is a temptation 
to treat God like a genie who is only to be rubbed just the right way and, and he'll give you what you want. Um, that is a temptation. Um, but after all, that's the way uh, many people regard God as a, as, as a power that gives us uh, what, whatever we want. Um, it's what God does. You know, God is supposed to do what we want, right? But we do take notice um, of God's answer to these seven sons of Siva. Uh, for we must know that God gives permission to Satan to harass, just as he gave permission to Satan, I guess I should say, to harass Job. Here in Acts 19, he gives permission to this evil one or these evil spirits to thrash and humiliate the seven sons who barely escape with their lives. God will not be manipulated or have the name of his holy son Jesus treated as an incantation. Um, the third commandment uh, is given specifically so that we would not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And, and how the Lord brings good of this too, notice. He uses this event. He uses the wickedness of these men. Word gets out. Word gets around what happened. And he uses it to good purpose. Uh, it brings about um, a great fear of God. Uh, many people in Ephesus are seized with fear. Now, Ephesus is an important place because it was a great uh, center of trade. And, and so when we read that uh, after two years, uh, people all over Asia uh, were hearing about Jesus, well, it was things like this <laughs> that the Lord did. Um, word gets around fast. You don't monkey around with Jesus. And <clears throat> some of those who thought that they could call themselves Christians and yet were two-timing God and trafficking with idols and idol worship started to think twice. Some of those who thought they could have one foot in the kingdom and another foot in the world, some of those even within the fledgling church there who had not yet given up their idols, who were living a double life, were now filled with a holy fear of God and, and, um, and they threw their idols into a bonfire and made a clean break of it. And look at the result, verse 20. So the word of God continued to increase and prevail mightily. Mightily, that's, that's not a surprise. God always blesses total surrender, doesn't he? We wonder what might have happened to the woos uh, since those years of the 1980s. Uh, how did God bless their good purpose? Did he sustain them from temptation and inevitable family disapproval and pleasure? I'm sure we should hope and expect that he does and did. But what of each of us? Are there scrolls that need to be burned in our lives? Perhaps some idolatry that needs to be uprooted rooted and, 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 and heaped onto the flames, perhaps um, in your life uh, and conduct. Uh, there are things that don't belong there in your thoughts and in your lives. Burn them. Get rid of them. Maybe you can think of something that you think that's not really what it should be. Uh, don't be a dupe. Don't be a slave. Commit your intentions to Christ and ask him to help you clean house and defeat the devil and his works. And what about your prayers? Are you treating God like some sort of genie who's there to grant your every wish and, and give you profit and prosperity at every turn? Let's, um, uh, let's not make our prayers anything like incantations. They're humble uh, requests to the Lord made in faith uh, with great joy. And let's stand up ourselves and sing this last hymn that the woos sang as they washed their hands of idolatry. So we do get to stand. I didn't I give you much chances to stand this evening, but here's our last chance. 477, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Can't very well uh, sing this one, sit it. So 477. <clears throat> Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Five seventy one, five seven one, sorry. Five seven one. 
pray for your grace to always put you first in our lives and to treat you as you are a holy and mighty God with great love and yet with a certain respect and fear for you are the Lord. We pray that you would give us grace to, uh, uh, to put away things that should be put away and never to uh, seek to manipulate you but to come as your humble loving children. Father, we uh, thank you for your church, which has ever stood uh, for those things uh, which you speak in your word and direct us in holy ways. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to give the benediction, and then we're going to sing our benedictory hymn. I mention that because we don't do that every Sunday. The words, however, are in the both, and so you don't need to turn to... 386, because you know God be with you till we meet again. But receive now upon your heads God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and give you grace now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.